Welcome to the Pharma Podcast, conversations with industry experts and business leaders about important and current topics in Canadian pharma, biotech, and medtech. I'm your host, Sam Tarantino. On this episode of the Pharma Podcast, my guest is Brian Bloom, CEO of Bloom Burton. On the heels of the Bloom Burton Healthcare Investor Conference, uh, which was held in Toronto on May 2nd to the 3rd, Brian and I will discuss the latest developments in Canadian healthcare companies. Welcome back to the Pharma Podcast, Brian. Thanks, Sam. Thanks for having me again. Let's start with the Bloom Burton uh, Healthcare Investor Conference. Uh, tell us about the Investor Conference and, and how it went. Well, firstly, it was our best one yet. It was a smashing success. I think we were very lucky to hold it just around the time post-COVID or post the serious part of COVID when everyone was just starting to reemerge, meet in person again and embrace each other and see each other. And people were desperate for human interaction. So it was great. We, um, you know, we held it at the Metro Toronto Convention Center and it really is, I mean, it is an investment banking conference and a healthcare conference. So the whole purpose is to bring great Canadian companies and international investors together. But it really transcends Bloom Burton and the investment industries. It, it transcends it to the point where it really is Canada's healthcare conference. So everyone in the ecosystem from academics to government actors to advocacy organizations, presenting companies and non-presenting companies, investors and people who want to be investors. It seems that everyone in our ecosystem came out with a deep, deep desire to reconnect, um, to see their friends in the ecosystem and and to party and, and to socialize. So the energy was fantastic. The attendance was way better than we anticipated. We broke all of our records. We had uh, close to 1200 people there, uh, packed rooms and packed plenary rooms and ballrooms. Our cocktail party was packed and it was just a, an amazing time. That's awesome. Congratulations. So tell us about the investment landscape. Where are we in the investment market? Yeah, so, you know, the investment market is really tough right now. We've just come off of 10 years of monetary and fiscal stimulus and, um, you know, and, and a risk on environment in both the private and the public capital markets and asset values that have been rising pretty much across the board. And especially in biotech and in healthcare, um, especially in the risky areas like digital health and in drug development. Uh, we've been in a super bull market, a very frothy bull market since 2020, thanks in part to COVID. You know, it was the biotech industry and the pharma industry which came to the rescue and created the drugs and vaccines which got the world out of this horrible pandemic. And because of that, especially in 2020, in the, in the first half of the pandemic, the past two years, um, we saw stocks like Moderna and Novavax and a lot of the therapeutic companies like Abcelera and others just skyrocket. And we've had so much capital flow into our sector and so much capital available uh, to the point where I think about one year ago, even the professional investors were losing some of their discipline and they were putting too much money into too many risky things. So all of that has deflated or sort of unwound over the past 12 months. And it's not just in healthcare too, taking a step back, the FANG stocks, you know, the Facebooks and Googles and the other risk sectors like clean tech and crypto and all these things that I, I know much less about. It seems that everything is unwinding and not just the risk areas. It, uh, as someone pointed out to me just last week, um, it seems that all asset classes whether it's hard assets or profitable companies, large caps and risky small cap and private valuations, everything has come down over the past three months um, or at least five months, year to date since 2022 began. So it's been a really, really painful market uh, for healthcare and as I mentioned, for every asset class. But the good news is, you know, the whole healthcare industry over the past uh, five to 10 years, and I'm talking about biotech, medical devices, um, pharma and digital health and services, all areas of the healthcare industry have really matured and are sort of creating new products and services based on really powerful technologies. 
uh, such as you know, digital technologies and biotechnologies. Uh, there's no better example than Moderna and Pfizer going from the sequence of COVID to a prototype within weeks, testing humans within months, and within you know eight, nine months from the start of their project, actually having an approved and fully scaled up manufacturing product, manufactured product in market to actually be distributed all around the world. All of that illustrates uh, a matured industry from research to commercialization. And that was just the best illustration or example of what's going on across our whole industry, whether it's how we deliver healthcare or how the biotech and pharma industries develop new products, which they're doing not just for COVID, but for Alzheimer's and for, for rare diseases, for specialty diseases, for oncology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So tough capital markets, but um, thankfully a maturing industry with great tools, great people, lots of capital on the sidelines, and you know, doing great, great things for patients and the healthcare systems around the world. So the revaluation we are seeing in the markets, is that tied to rising interest rates? Um, is, this, uh, is this new interest rate environment getting rid of the froth and, and bringing the market to a more realistic valuation? Yeah, it's been triggered by a lot of things. Um, obviously, the war in Russia and Ukraine and uh, supply side shocks, um, you know, uh, and of course, inflation and therefore interest rates, which need to rise after being near zero for a decade, probably not appropriately so. Uh, you know, we've been in constant post post Great Recession crisis for 10, 12 years, and I, I'm not sure our economies actually have been in crisis, but yet we've had governments and other actors acting as if we have been. So, yeah, what goes up must come down. And, uh, you know, the, 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 at least the research side of healthcare, maybe not Pfizer and Novartis and AbbVie and Johnson & Johnson or Medtronic are really big companies, but the smaller, riskier companies that launch products or even earlier than that, test new drugs or discover new drugs, you know, they get hit the hardest because they're on the far, far end of that risk spectrum. So if we go back to the Bloomberg uh, Healthcare Investor Conference, can you share with us uh, what was heard, discussed, learned? Yeah, I'd love to. So the format of our conference is two days, 66 companies that are all Canadian that are both private and publicly traded on the Toronto Exchange or on NASDAQ um, presenting what they're doing and their investment case to our audience of investors. Um, those 66 companies have 30 minutes each. They, When they're not on stage presenting their company, they're doing obviously networking with the investors in the audience and they are also doing private one-on-one -on -one meetings with institutional investors. So they may have 10 or 20 meetings where they can you know, privately pitch large fund managers of mutual funds or hedge funds or venture capital funds or private equity funds. Um, also interspersed during the breakfast and lunch sessions, we had a, a keynote address by Peter Kolchinsky of RA Capital talking about the value of modern medicines and the touchy touchy topic of drug pricing. And I also moderate two investor panels, one that focuses on pre-commercial stage companies or R&D stage companies. So those are mostly venture capital investors or public venture investors. And we have another panel that focuses on revenue and profit stage companies or companies that are in market trying to launch, grow and defend their markets or establish new markets in healthcare. So lots of rich content um, to provide uh, your audience with what's going on in, in the healthcare investment you know, sector. Um, I would say that um, you know, my, my impression from the 66 companies that presented was they were all generally optimistic, confident about the decisions that they've made, what they're doing, um, not a lot of talk about right-sizing their organizations or cutting costs because of the financial market and capital being a little bit tighter or their stock prices being down. You know, what I heard from them was full steam ahead generally, which was both exciting, but also a little bit scary given that some of these companies may be running out of capital in the next year. And I was thinking to myself, 
how are they going to fund these grand plans? Um, but I, I think that they were talking as if it was 2021. And again, that's both good because they're confident and doing great things uh, for their shareholders and for patients and for the healthcare system, for what they're developing and researching and launching, but also a little bit scary because I feel that some of them still had rose-colored glasses on and they may not be viewing the current capital climate correctly. When we switch to the panels, you know, I'd say that uh, the major thing coming from the from the mouths of these investors who flew in from San Francisco and Boston and overseas, these expert investors that uh, where I moderated this, these panels, they're, they really believe that this huge correction um, or coming down to earth or reset in asset prices in our sector wasn't anything to be too pessimistic about, quite the opposite. They were so excited that there, even though there were bad companies that have come down to earth who deserved it, the, for the most part, there were great companies that are now on sale um, and trading at lower prices and trading at better valuations, some of them trading at negative enterprise values, and that they were salivating over. They were saying this is a once in a generation or once in a career opportunity to buy assets in the middle of a crash um, that are high quality, great management, doing great things, and all of these assets in our industry are, quote, on sale, and they can't wait to go shopping. So quite optimistic from the mouths of the investors. In this rising rate environment, the ability to raise capital and tap into the market, will it shift away from the capital markets? Oh, yeah, it's, it's definitely harder. So it was only one year or 14 months ago, a year and a bit, when we were kind of at the peak of the market, when even the worst companies in our sector, the penny stocks that were doing horrible science with bad management teams, you know, they were doing IPOs and overnight public offerings, raising 50 or a hundred million dollars at a time. And, and, you know, that's where we were. And now we're at the complete opposite end of the coin. Uh, opposite side of the coin, where even great companies find it more difficult to raise capital. So, uh, yes, the reality has changed, but the good news is capital is, lots of capital is there. The better healthcare venture funds and public equity funds and private equity funds and mutual funds are actually raising more capital. They're calling up their limited partners saying this is a once in a career and once in a generation opportunity to put money to work. So even though our portfolios are down 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 percent, it's not going to, we're not going to be here a year or two or three from now. So let's, let's take advantage of this reset. So there is cash, uh, lots of cash on the sideline. There's lots of cash coming into our sector through these investors. The only thing that's washed out is the hyperbole, the, the froth, the Robin Hood investors, the meme stocks, the GameStop investors who find the next COVID stock and, you know, sort of talk online about how it's going to go up 10x by next week. All that nonsense is gone. But that nonsense is gone and that capital has flooded or, you know, that tide has gone out of our sector and it's taken with it and dragged down a lot of, you know, the valuations of a lot of good companies. So what we have left are generally great deserving companies that deserve growth capital, lots of cash and more cash coming into our sector, and it will be thoughtfully deployed and our sector should be just fine. Do you think at least in the short term, more companies will remain private for longer? Definitely. Yeah, I think on the venture capital, yeah, the already public companies are going to, you know, they're the ones that actually have a stock price. So when they need to raise capital, they have a reference price. Um, the private companies, their issue is they feel that they're insulated from everything that's gone on in the stock market and they're not. Um, if you're a phase two cancer company and the company and you're private and you look to the stock market last year and you say, look, companies that were phase two with drugs like ours, they're worth a billion dollars. Um, if those companies are now worth $200 million, um, the private companies that look, you, when it was convenient for them to look at benchmarks in the public market to say how, how, 
how to defend their valuation and you know to to sort of defend and say how high their valuation is they don't seem to get the clue that when when the public benchmarks come down to earth then their valuation should as well um, but for the companies that are private and seeking capital, they need to come to terms with the fact that even in the private market where there's no quote, where there's no stock price or benchmark, um, you know, things have come back down to earth and they need to, they need to close the bid-ask spread between um, the price, the value of their company and, and where investors value them and where investors, what valuation investors are willing to put money into their company. Uh, but when it comes to companies that are already venture-backed, already with sponsorship, uh, yes, those boards, those venture investors, and those companies, there's no quick exit into the public market uh, anytime soon. The IPO market is pretty much shut, not fully, um, but it is 5 to 10% of what it was a year ago. And that means that you know these boards, these investors, and these management teams need to come to terms with the fact that they need to be private longer and they need to hit some meaningful uh, milestones and generate some meaningful differentiated clinical data before they will be accepted by public market investors. You know, gone are the days when private companies can weave a narrative or a sexy story of being a, a gene editing company or a synthetic biology company and have a napkin plan raise a couple hundred million dollars from VCs and really have no data. Those companies that could IPO in 2020 and 2021, they can't anymore. They got to move the ball further afield. They need to generate really important data and then they can IPO. So the IPO window is pretty much shut for all but um, mature or the best companies. Maybe a refocus on a healthy balance sheet and a clear path to profitability? No, not a path to profitability. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna correct you there. So, uh, remember, the IPO class is is mainly for R and D stage or pre-commercial companies that are gener that are running clinical trials or running preclinical trials in mice or benchmarking against, you know, clinically um, benchmarking against other uh, drugs that are on the market in clinical studies. The the path to value creation for these companies is not profit. It is, it is meaningful differentiating data and evidence. You know, you shrink tumors or you shorten the course of disease, um, you save the system money, um, or you, you do something clinically or from a quality life standpoint that no one else in development or on market can do. And you can have a very, very high implied value years before you have revenue or profit. Um, but I think the point is we, you know, these companies need to have much more convincing data in hand before being to IPO and, and to be able to raise capital in the public market for the already public companies. And yeah, it's, uh, f but as you said, f companies that are profitable, you're right for the post commercial companies, for the companies that have launched products, they need to ensure that their markets are already developed and they have evidence that people are buying what they're selling and their growth is, and there's evidence that there's growth and uptake and reimbursement and value for their products, whether they're profitable or not. Um, that's when commercial stage companies may be able to IPO or for the already public companies, whether they be able to maintain the investors that they have and attract new ones. Let's zero in on the state of the Canadian startup ecosystem. What is the current state and what uh, do you anticipate the future state to look like? Yeah, so I mean, the Canadian environment for startups in healthcare, whether it's biotech or new specialty pharmas or new device or diagnostic companies or digital health companies, I would say that it, it had a Canadian definition that was more than just geographic as to where the companies were birthed and where their people are and where their headquarters are maybe 10 to 20 years ago. There really was a distinction between the have not Canadian companies. There's no capital. And we can't find the right people and we don't know what we're doing. We're, you know, we're, we're sort of a second rate environment compared to um, the more established Silicon Valley or um, you know, the Harvard and MIT neighborhood around Boston or New York or London or San Francisco. I would say that 
um, our startup ecosystem was distinct for being a have-not 10 to 20 years ago. Over the past 10 years, though, we've had enormous successes. And this isn't just in biotech and in healthcare. We have in tech with Shopify and Research in Motion and all sorts of great companies outside of healthcare. The Canadian startup ecosystem has critical mass with respect to technologies and startups and ecosystem and, and uh, you know, contributors like universities and accelerators and incubators that help these companies form and grow. You know, we are now indistinguishable from those other international ecosystems in the United States and Europe that are good at supporting startups. So our challenges now though are, you know, there's no shortage of capital um, when it comes to startups. The best companies find venture investors, whether they're here or whether those investors are outside of Canada. Um, and there's no shortage of great ideas, whether they're birthed in a university lab or in someone's garage, you know, um, uh, you know, or in someone coding late at night, uh, or someone with an idea at a bar with a napkin who scribbles something down, oh, this is a great business idea. So on the idea side, or in the capital side, there's absolutely nothing holding back our ecosystem. The, the, the one lament and challenge that I have is our crop of C-suite management teams is still very lacking. So Canada still suffers from not having enough CEOs and in our area, chief development and medical officers, regulatory, um, there just aren't enough in the biopharma industry like what they have in Boston or in San Francisco, where they have uh, lots of management teams and C-suite executives that have started, grown, and sold or floated or monetized their fourth or fifth companies and they're on to their sixth or seventh. They have an ecosystem of these really sage and wise and experienced biopharma entrepreneurs that are sit on boards and mentor the next crop of young executives or scientists or inventor entrepreneurs. So that's really lacking in Canada. It's, it's getting better. It's better than it was five years ago. It's better than it was two years ago. But as I like to joke, we only have maybe six really good biotech CEOs in Canada and they all have jobs. So it's, it's, um, you know, we, we're definitely lacking on the people side, but we are not lacking on the brains and dollar side. Um, lots of uh, international investors have had great success uh, backing Canadian startup companies, and they're more than willing to look for the next big winner and to back those today. So on the capital and the ideation side, you know, we don't need government support. And actually, speaking of government support, I don't think we need any. I can't think of an area, you know, government can't solve the people issue. A time can. And, uh, you know, um, uh, just people with Rolodexes like you and me can help out. Um, so there isn't a silver bullet to solve the people issue. But overall, I, I'm so excited about and confident in our startup ecosystem. And I hear of great new company ideas that get pitched to us at least once a week. So if we get 50 new good healthcare ideas that enter our ecosystem and enter our industry, uh, you know, every like once a week, that's, that's a pretty darn good pace. So I'm very optimistic. From a deal flow perspective, have you seen any change? Yeah, I, I would say from a deal flow, especially in the private markets, you know, the public markets, we pick through the companies, we know which 10 or 20 companies we like, and, and that's not really expanding with higher quality companies. But in the private space, VC backed, um, private equity backed, growth equity backed, or not just founder backed, um, you know, non-sponsored or non non-institutional investor sponsored companies. Yeah, I, I think the quality across the board, whether it's in digital health services, specialty pharma, biotech, or, or, you know, or, or sort of crossover companies that could be, um, you know, AI applied to digital or AI applied to biotech or integrated biopharma companies um, or drug device companies, that, you know, in every class. I see a higher level of quality, 
again, people aside, because <laughs> we talked about that, a higher level of quality of the science about what constitutes a startup business, what the plans are for commercialization, what the plans are to raise and spend money and create value for founders and investors. I think it's the quality of all of it is just rising. And I'm, I'm, I, that's why I continue to be optimistic about Bloom Burton and about our business and about the investors we speak to and about the Canadian sector. You mentioned the importance of local talent. Does that really matter in the time of Zoom? Well, it's not important from the fact that if a company recruits a great C-suite in Boston or Texas or Florida or San Francisco and the ideation and the research team and the founding team remains in Canada. You can still take that Canadian technology, have a Canadian headquartered business, and grow it into an international success story. But wouldn't it be, I don't even want to say better, but you know, it, it is better for our ecosystem if we start developing the local talent who can then, without needing to look abroad, create anchor companies here in Canada that are fully integrated with the full management teams here that develop those skills to test, uh, gain approval and launch, you know, drugs or devices or products or services internationally, and then, and then translate that knowledge into mentoring the next generation of local Canadian talent that can do it with their own companies. Whether those people uh, who learned their lessons and had their successes, start their next companies, join next companies, or sit on boards or advise the next companies. So that's how an ecosystem matures. That's what Boston and San Francisco are now for biotech. That's what uh, Minnesota and, and other places are in medical technology. That's what Silicon Valley and, and other jurisdictions are in digital health. Uh, and, you know, we're on our way to developing that here. So it, it is important. Again, it's, it's, um, it's not like our, it's, it's not like our, our sector and our industry can't grow, but we would be so much better off by developing the people here. What about the investment climate specific to pharma, specialty pharma and uh, pharma services? I think I've talked enough about uh, drug discoverers and developers, which we can call, you know, biotech. Um, so switching to specialty pharma. So specialty pharma, of course, is defined as uh, a company that develops just in, for a specific geography or in a specific, um, you know, therapeutic indication, like just dermatology or just oncology. Um, or it could be companies that are more M&A and license focused, where all they do, they don't do any R&D. Um, but they launch products either narrowly in a specific therapeutic indication or just for a geography like just Europe or just Latin America or just Canada for that matter, right? With the most famous example being Paladin, uh, Knight and these sorts of companies. Um, the investment climate for specialty pharma has been hell. It's been in the toilet since 2015 when Valiant went on their acquisition binge. Um, when it was just a sort of a financial house, house of cards, take on debt, buy companies, jack up the prices of the drugs, fire everyone, uh, you know, create those synergies. And, and of course, uh, there was no worse actor than Martin Shkreli who bought a drug. I don't think he did anything illegal in the pharmaceutical market. He may have actually uh, done something illegal with his investors, but um, that's a separate issue. I don't think he did anything illegal by jacking up the price of a drug, but it certainly wasn't, a, 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 wasn't great for the specialty pharma image and the pharmaceutical industry that one could buy a drug, uh, increase the price 10 times, and, and call that a business model. You know, there's nothing, nothing good for society about that business model. So, you know, there was a huge hangover, certainly in the public markets, which by the way, hasn't turned around. So the public markets, whether on NASDAQ or the Toronto Exchange, for specialty pharmaceuticals has been really tough for seven years. And that doesn't, I don't even think it's turning around anytime soon. It's turned around for a few companies like HLS in Canada, um, Horizon and Jazz in the United States, but they've really focused on products that can grow, where they have patented products that are launched in their, in their, in their 
a therapeutic area of specialization or the geography of specialization. And they're really growth biopharmas, integrated biopharmas with really great products. So, you know, but for the other 97% of companies that are publicly traded in specialty pharma, it has been horrible and that's not going to change anytime soon. On the private side, we've seen a lot of uh, renewed interest from private equity firms and from founder launched and family office launched specialty pharma companies that are sort of picking up the pieces, finding niche and unique opportunities, putting them together, uh, launching new companies and being able to to raise capital. So I would say just in the past couple years, you know, maybe 2015 to 2020, the private specialty market was as challenged as the public market or publicly traded market. But in the past couple of years, we've had a lot of mutual funds and private equity funds and sovereign wealth funds and other funds approach us saying, you know, we're, we're interested in specialty pharma or in generic or in reformulated products. Um, or in fielding a sales force and cobbling together uh, portfolios of assets uh, better than big pharma can, or you know, just picking up the pieces of a highly fragmented industry and creating new companies. So I'm actually quite optimistic about specialty pharma. I think it's been in the doghouse for too long. Pharma services, wow. When it comes to contract research, contract development, contract manufacturing or other pharma services that are outsourced by pharma, such as patient management or third-party logistics or uh, infusion centers or delivery of, of information or products or services to physicians, to payers or to patients. That whole sector has been incredibly hot, both private and in the public market for the past five years. And it's one of the few insulated uh, subsectors in healthcare that despite this reset or drawdown in valuations and in the public market that's dragged down the private market that we talked about at the outset of this podcast, it hasn't really been affected. There's been a few deals in this year in 2022 in the M&A deals and a few private equity deals. And it's one of the few areas of healthcare that seems to be quite insulated from what's going on broadly in the capital markets. So it's, it remains a very hot sector, pharma services, which I think is, is an area that you work in, Sam. I do indeed. Any final uh, insights you want to share with the audience? Yeah, I, I would, my final thought is, you know, we, we remain in the early to mid innings of what I call a golden age for medicine and medical research. All of this research and these modern tools as best illustrated by going from idea to fully scaled manufactured product uh, with COVID vaccines and COVID therapeutics in less than a year. You know, all of this new wealth of knowledge and our understanding of disease biology and precision and molecular medicine and these novel tools are infiltrating the whole R&D and commercial ecosystem of not just biotech and pharma, but the same thing is happening on the digital side in devices and how we deliver healthcare, um, uh, pay for and deliver and create great value for patients and everyone uh, on the on the accepting and on the on the consumer side of healthcare. So, with all of that said, and despite what's going on with interest rates and stimulus and government spending and and stock prices, if you were to ignore that because that will correct itself, whether it takes six months, which I don't think it will, or a couple years, which I think it will. That aside, the fundamentals of the innovative healthcare system and the innovative healthcare industry are as strong as they have ever been. And we still have another major, major um, surge that will happen with new products and new growth and new solutions and new great things that can happen, as mentioned, as, as best illustrated by what our industry did during COVID, this worldwide emergency. The technologies we applied, the products we made, how quickly they were able to change people's lives. That's going to happen across the board. That has already, but it's going to continue to happen. And, you know, I, I, I agree with our panelists at the Bloomberg Healthcare Investor Conference that if you are patient, and you don't fuss too much about stock prices that bob up and down by 10 or 20 percent. 
This really is the best buying opportunity in a generation to buy into our sector and to participate in this wealth creation and this value creation. Uh, Brian, always appreciate your uh, insight and thank you for being a recurring guest on the Pharma Podcast and, and sharing your insights. How can our listeners connect with you? Well, um, I think on, uh, on the podcast description, you know, you can send a link to our, to our website, uh, which has my full contact details there. And, you know, if anyone wants to reach out to, to you, Sam, directly, certainly you can connect your audience members to me. We're here to help anyone in the investment or the company ecosystem in Canada uh, connect with each other and grow value in their companies. That's why Bloomberton exists. And I'm very, very grateful, Sam, that you've invited me back. Happy to do this again a third time uh, to continue sharing our views as long as uh, people are interested in them, in the investment and the healthcare industry in Canada. The contact details for Brian will indeed be made available on our website at thepharmapodcast.ca. Thank you for listening. The Pharma Podcast is available to listen to for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and on our website at thepharmapodcast.ca. We are also available on YouTube. Please subscribe and follow me on LinkedIn to stay up to date on future podcasts. If you would like to be a guest on this podcast, or if there is a topic we should cover in a future podcast, please connect with me via LinkedIn.